Mixing tends to be overemphasized in terms of importance to making amazing sounding music and frankly overcomplicated in terms of the process. After having thousands of conversations with musicians and producers, getting better at the mix and achieving that pro sound are absolutely one of the top challenges that they've told me that they're facing. If you're looking for magic plugin settings or the secret mixing and mastering effect chain or look like this when you're mixing, there's actually a way deeper problem that we have to solve. Hey yo, it's Alex from Metamind Music. I'm a musician and certified audio engineer here to help you level up your music and unlock your creativity. In this video, I'm gonna share with you my five must know mixing concepts to get pro results faster. If you watch until the end, you'll find out the secret weapon that separates decent mixes from pro mixes. This was inspired by another creator, Philip from Pick Yourself. He's absolutely amazing and we share very similar philosophies on both the creative and mixing process and both value and support true artistry in the music production space. And he is the real deal. He runs a legit studio and is a pro mixing and mastering engineer with countless projects under his belt. On his channel, he provides insane insights from being a professional mixing and mastering engineer who runs their own studio, as well as some insider tips and tricks from some of the artists that he's worked with who have had amazing careers that have blown up. He also shares a bunch of super practical techniques that you can immediately implement to level up your production skills with every single video. So if you haven't already, do yourself a favor and check out his channel. The link will be in the description. All right, and this brings me to the number one tip, which is the mixing mindset, okay? And yes, mixing has an art and a science to it, but it is first and foremost an art form, okay? So you want to think like an artist instead of only like an engineer, okay? Especially if you're mixing your own music. And the reason that I bring this up is that if you're listening to your mix like an engineer by focusing on the numbers and the graphs and the information that you're getting visually as to your high end, your low end, etc., you're most likely going to destroy the aesthetic of your song. So what do I mean by that? Well, trying to make things perfect or free of error, right, isn't the actual goal of mixing. This is actually the opposite of what a good mix does. A good mix is exciting and brings out the most energy from what already exists in the composition. So long as there isn't any glaring frequency or dynamics problems that aren't distracting, nobody cares about your mix or the technical moves you did except for other audio nerds and other audio engineers, which is like 0 0.0001 of the population, okay? All they care about is how the music makes them feel. Don't get me wrong, you want to be aware of the technical foundations and intricacies, but you want them to be in service to the art, okay? Mixing is about creating a sonic aesthetic for the music. It's the presentation of the music. And while you're mixing, you're framing your thinking so differently compared to when you're composing or producing. If you have that frame while mixing, I guarantee you that you'll make much better mixing decisions. All right, number two is to start with a really good composition and production. Okay, before you even consider starting to mix, stop and just make sure that your composition and production stages of your track have been properly done first. The reason for this is that when you're mixing, you're shifting to a completely different mindset and you don't wanna be jumping back and forth between editing tasks and then changing the composition, okay? If you do this, you'll constantly get out of flow and you'll be working against yourself. Personally, I don't worry about or even bother editing, mixing, or mastering a track that's not a great composition. Okay, a well-structured arrangement, high quality source sounds and tight edits will be the biggest factor in getting an amazing sounding mix anyways. An easy way to create better compositions is to focus on making rough compositions, okay? And by a rough composition, it's basically a big brushstroke idea for a track. All you need is a structure with a beginning, middle, and end to bring the listener on a journey with a sense of dynamics, tension, and release contrast to hopefully impact the listener. The key to a rough composition is that you're not concerned with any of the super detailed work. This removes any unnecessary pressure and expectation and allows you to just write more in general. Naturally, this will lead to some truly extraordinary compositions compared to the rest without the pressure of, oh, I need to make an amazing composition, you'll just naturally see that some of your compositions will be better than others, okay? And without a doubt, the best way to have an amazing sounding mix is to have an amazing sounding composition 
composition and production. In the system that I use and teach my clients, we only mix the absolute highest quality compositions, which happens naturally by virtue of this process and system. No more polishing turds and no more trying to fix it in the mix. If you want to learn more about the system and how it can help you write awesome compositions while staying in flow, check out the masterclass with the link below. Number three is A-B testing, okay? And this is super, super, super important when you're mixing to ensure that you're not working against yourself. Okay, so why is this so important? Well, the reason is that the most powerful parameter that we have while mixing is volume. And why is that? Because psychologically, we think that louder sounds better by default, okay? So it's very easy to trick yourself into thinking that something sounds better just because it's louder. So keeping your eye on metering while mixing can be a very useful tool to help you make better mix decisions. A close second to volume is frequency, which is basically a volume control for specific frequencies. All right, so let's hop into Ableton and talk about metering real quick because this simple tool can be such a game changer for your mixes if you haven't been doing so already. All right, so I'm gonna go back in Ableton here. We're gonna hop over into session view where we have all our mixer controls and to fun tip, you can actually expand this if you're not seeing it. So you can have more resolution on your tracks, okay? And what we're gonna focus on is your peak signal and your RMS signal, okay? So we have two different meters when we play things in Ableton. So for example, I'll solo the drums, right? And we can see that we have a light green meter and we have a dark green meter. Now, the dark green meter represents your peak metering, and this shows you the loudest point that a signal hits, okay? And in general, high volume spikes, especially in the low end frequencies, can be beyond what our human ears can perceive. And this is where peak metering comes in because it shows us how loud the peaks are, even though it might not be how loud we're perceiving it, okay? Which gets very important when you're getting to later stages of a mix and even into mastering. The other type of metering, the light green meter, is your RMS metering, which is short for root means squared, fancy math term, it doesn't really matter. And all it is, is the average loudness of a signal over time, which is a lot closer to how humans perceive loudness. Okay, so RMS metering specifically helps us volume match tracks to enable you to accurately A-B test all of your processing. Okay, so you want to make sure that there's no difference in RMS as you're listening to your mixing moves. All right, so to demo this, I'm just going to solo our snare track in our drum bus here, in our drum group. And I'm going to go ahead and toggle the EQ on and off, which is just shifting the tone of the snare. But I'm going to keep an eye on the RMS to make sure that this EQ isn't introducing a ton of volume and biasing us to thinking that it sounds better. Okay, so let's go ahead and play it with it on. Let's look at the RMS. right around minus 20 or so. Now let's turn it off and let's check it out. Right, so we're essentially the same volume. So this enables us to listen to what the processor is actually doing by keeping the volume as a constant. Because if you're increasing the volume when you're doing EQ moves or you're doing saturator moves or doing compression moves, right? And it gets louder by doing the processing, you're gonna think it sounds better even if it isn't necessarily sounding better, right? Just because it's louder. So very important to do to A-B test all of your moves. All right, so number four is thinking about featuring instead of balance. So what do I mean by this. A lot of people will refer to balancing a mix or I want my mix to sound more balanced, right? And don't get me wrong, a lot of people refer to it as getting the frequency spectrum to be somewhat balanced so that your high end isn't like super loud and your low end is like, you know, weak and everything. So you want a frequency balance, which makes sense. Okay, but balancing the frequency spectrum is just a small feature of what we do during a mix. In terms of the overall focus, it's contrary to what a lot of people aim for. Balanced is actually not what you're going for in a mix, okay? It makes way more sense to frame your thinking in terms of what are you featuring in the track. And this is a big shift in thinking if you've been approaching your mixes in the past in terms of trying to make everything sound clear and everything be the same volume, right? We kind of want to think about, well, what are we featuring in your mix, right? What do we want the listener to pay attention to? Because if you can hear everything, people aren't going to focus on what you want them to focus on. And it actually doesn't 
highlight the detail of anything, right? If everything is detailed, then by virtue of contrast, nothing will be detailed. But if you focus like on one or two elements during your mix or at different sections of your track, right? And you really accentuate the detail of those things and the other tracks maybe take a back seat for that moment in time, you're effectively featuring that track and then the details of it will be a lot easier to perceive from the listener. And a great concept that illustrates this is what is called the cocktail party effect, which is a cognitive bias of our brain. So it's basically like a psychological thing that happens <laughs> just automatically with our brains. And there's a ton of them and it's really important to understand them in the creative process when you're making music. Think of yourself at a cocktail party, right? So it's just like having a conversation with a few people at a party by virtue you're focusing on them, okay? You're blocking out the rest of the noise and all the other voices and conversations so that you can focus on what these two people are saying who are in front of you that you're having a conversation with. We can actually shift our focus very quickly. So at this party, you could be focused on what these two people are saying and having a conversation with, but you could kind of zone out, right? And focus on what other people are saying or just the overall noise of the whole place, right? You can shift your focus very quickly, but the truth remains that there's still a max of what we can comprehend at any given moment. So when you're mixing, you want to accentuate that and you want to guide the listener's ear and attention to the most important parts at any given section. All right, easy way to think about it is, well, what are the main characters in your song, right? Who are the side characters and what might be the environment or the background, okay? But with sounds, of course, instead of characters. If you take the time to think about and feature specific parts and ideas throughout your track, your listeners will thank you with their undivided attention. All right, so let me show you a quick few demos of what I featured in this track so it can help you in thinking about what to feature in your track so aside from the intro we just bring it in but when the verse comes in essentially it's super simple and i want the riff to get stuck in the listener's head right that bass riff super simple okay and then this keyboard comes in so now the keyboard takes center stage and the bass goes in the back a little bit. And notice that by focusing you on that keyboard sound, you can hear the detail in the reverb of that sound because it's center stage, right? And I tucked the bass down a little bit volume wise so that we can focus on this. If we go to the chorus, the feature is definitely the guitar. So the guitar is a little bit louder than the other elements because that's what's leading the ear. And then there's this really interesting groove pulling it forward. So there's kind of a call and response happening with the main guitar and then those synths come in, right? So the, the synths are kind of the, the side character and the guitar is the main focus. And then at the end of the phrase, when the guitar is doing a fill, the drums come in and there's more excitement, okay? So there's definitely a specific focus when you're getting to that stage, right? When we get into the second verse, it's the trippy effect, right? Everything else is kind of taking the back seat and letting that effect breathe, this weird synth part. Right, we have like that reggae chord in the back, right? And we have some like super spaced out pads, but the feature is that trippy synth effect, okay? Everything else is kind of letting it take center stage, right? And you can also do this with processing. Let's say that later in the tune, you want these reggae chords to be a little bit more apparent. You could automate the EQ so that there's maybe a little bit more high-end frequency for the second time they come through stuff like this. All right, and finally, number five, the secret, okay? One of the biggest game changers that I've come across in my mixes, and the single thing that everyone I've talked to that is a pro mixing engineer, pro mastering engineer, says is what separates like a decent mix from a professional mix. The key to understanding the secret is to have an understanding as to what happens
happens in the mastering stage, okay? So in a mix, you do the individual processing on tracks and group processing and maybe some mixed bus processing, okay? But then you export your finalized mix into one stereo file, okay? So you're combining all these individual tracks where you're really zoomed in on the details, you're processing them, you're processing the groups, maybe doing some processing on the entire mix, right? Then you're bouncing it out into one stereo file. Then you either send that to a mastering engineer or you master it yourself. One of the major goals of mastering is to increase the perceived loudness of your music so that it competes with all the other tracks in your genre. I won't get into the whole rabbit hole of talking about the loudness wars, but essentially everyone tries to get their music as loud as possible because we perceive louder as being better. And usually this is done by a combination of clipping, compression, subtle master EQ and limiting. And by far the most important process of mastering is using the limiter. All right, so what's this game changing secret? What do I mean by this? Here's the secret. The less that you challenge the limiter, the clearer and louder your mix and master will be. The biggest factor will be the loudest peak signals of your tracks, okay? So if you can lower the level of your highest peaks, you'll be able to get a louder master without distortion. And by far the biggest culprit for insane peaks is sounds with a lot of low frequency content. So think about subs, your bass, your kick drum, the low end of your snare, like crazy synth stabs, crazy effects, crazy transitions that have a lot of low end content. Enter peak metering. If you can shave off the peaks well below what we can audibly hear using a saturator, especially Ableton saturator, which is great at this, this reduces the gap between the peak level and the RMS levels on your individual track, okay? And this type of clipping done right does not affect the sound and lets you turn up the volume of that track louder before it clips and saves you headroom on your master bus, okay? So something to look out for in your mix is if some of your tracks have a big difference between peak and RMS, consider using a saturator. This will help prepare your mix for mastering. All right, so let's jump into Ableton so I can show you a few demos of what I'm talking about doing this. Okay, so I just grabbed my favorite limiter, which is the Pro L2, smacked it on the tail end of my mix bus, okay, on the master track. And essentially, I just wanna illustrate this once again. Essentially, what we're trying to do here is that as we're playing music back, Okay, your loudest peaks of your signal, which will be in your low end, which will be below what we can actually hear. Those spikes in low end is going to make the limiter react way faster and way more aggressively before it even gets to reacting to the main source material that is audible to our ears. Okay, so again, the secret here is we want to make sure to prepare our mix for mastering by ensuring to remove any peaks that don't need to be there, okay? And reducing the difference between peak level and RMS level, especially in the low end instruments. Right now, my mastering chain is fairly simple just to emulate what might happen during the mastering stage so I can test my mix through a limiter, okay? So I'm just doing some basic EQ, okay? I'm just ducking out like sub 30 Hertz just to shave off the low end. Okay. Because, because in generally you need less low end than you think you do. Then I have some multiband processing, just doing a little bit of a squeeze on different frequency bands to just really tighten it up. Okay. And glue it together. And then I have this coral backs, right? The, the good old backs. This is a free plugin. If you don't have it, I'll put in the link below. It's great for mastering. And here I'm just, again, low shelving off you know, sub 24 Hertz below what we can even hear. And I'm boosting a little bit of low end at 98, just a little bit a tad, you know what I'm saying? And I'm also adding in a little bit of high end. Okay. And then I'm shaving it off at 18,000 Hertz, 18 kilohertz. And then I also have this ozone limb imager too, which is great for checking your stereo imaging. Again, it's free, free plugin. I encourage you to get it. I'll put it in the link down below. Okay, it's great for having on your master bus to make sure that your stereo image isn't phase canceling and all this kind of stuff. We'll save that for another video. But essentially, I have the Pro L2 limiter here. So if we look at the snare here, okay, I have a saturator that is effectively doing that. It's removing the peak. So I'll A, B this to you, I'll solo it. So we can look at the difference between peak and RMS specifically on the snare before and after the saturator. So you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so here is the snare without the saturator. Right, you can see our peak is about minus three, right? And RMS about tw minus 24. Okay, so there's a big difference between the peak and the RMS. Our peak is hitting minus three dB and our 
RMS is hitting minus 24. So there's a massive difference between peak and RMS. And that shows us that, hey, we should probably look at reducing that peak before we get to the limiting stage, because if I leave it like this, that means that once we turn up the whole mix, that peak signal of the snare going to minus three, as soon as we turn everything up, that peak signal is going to smash into the limiter and the limiter is going to compress the whole mix based on the snare, right? Because the snare is going to be slamming against it and the limiter is going to be like, all right, bro, I'm going to push down your whole mix. So we need to try to reduce that so that at least the peak of the snare is closer to where everything else is living in the mix. Makes sense? Okay. So Let's go ahead and do this magic trick. I'm going to turn on the saturator. And the first thing I want you to notice, I'll A, B it. Can you hear the difference between the saturator being on or off? Okay. Okay. So to my ears, I don't hear any difference, right? It's negligible. But with the saturator on, check this out. Look at that. Our peak is at minus 13 now. And with it off, we're at minus 3 once again. So we just saved 10 dB of headroom by doing this simple move with the saturator. So now I can turn up my whole mix louder before getting into limiter because that peak isn't going to be slamming into that limiter. So your kick, your snare, your bass instruments will be common culprits of having massive peaks. And typically, you know, more mid-range instruments, keyboards, guitars, vocals won't have as much of a discrepancy between peak and RMS, but it's worth checking. And it, it doesn't hurt to put a saturator on if there's no audible difference, right? It's not changing the sound, but we're just removing the peaks of our signals so that when, hey, check it out, we go to our limiter here, we can turn it up louder. All right, so when do we actually use this limiter? Well, first I go to the loudest part of the track, which in my case, it's the chorus, okay? And then I'm gonna go ahead and pop open the L2, which is my limiter of choice, okay? And what we wanna do is make sure that we're on short-term LUFS when testing, okay? Because this is going to actually show you the changing volume instead of the average, right? If we go over here to integrated, it will show us the average volume over a certain amount of time. Short-term will show you the actual volume as close as possible in terms of LUFS, okay? And then what we wanna do is while we're testing, we wanna push the gain into the limiter into a competitive range, right? So it could be anything from, you know, I typically go with minus 14, minus 12, but it can go up to minus 10 depending on the genre of your music and what other people do, right? And of course, it depends on where you're planning on hosting the track. If you're planning on going to Spotify, they're gonna turn you down if you go past their loudness target, okay? So you just wanna aim it for that loudness target. If you're playing this track at a live set, right? You're going to crank this up way louder to compete with everything else that's playing live. All right, so let's go ahead and give that a go. All right, so to my ears, we can get this thing pretty damn loud. Minus seven, minus six, which is way louder than I probably would go for with little to no distortion or audible pumping, okay? And that's because this mix has been prepped for mastering, okay? The great question is how does this help us make better decisions? Well, it will reveal the flaws in your mix very quickly. All right, so this is a great move to do, right? Before you move on to finalizing your mix and moving on to the mastering stage is to ensure that none of your tracks are challenging the limiter like crazy and creating all this audible distortion. And you can check that with this little button if you want. Okay. And then from there, it will tell you what mixing decisions you need to do. Okay. Well, maybe we need to remove some low end. Okay. Maybe the sub bass and the bass are way too loud and have way too peak signals. So we got to chill that out, right? Maybe we got to do some peak limiting. Maybe we got to turn down the low end, EQ it out, all that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. We talked about the most important concepts to keep in mind when mixing, but we didn't cover the actual mixing process. So if you want to learn a step-by-step -step workflow to get your mix from A to Z, I invite you to click right here. We're going to go through the entire process A to Z to get a mix done. All right. So I will see you in that video.